So, thank you, Jean-François. So, I'm going to talk about recent work, joint work with Gabriele Viaggi. He's a postdoc in in Rome, and he's also somewhere here in the audience. I don't know where. Ah, yeah, here in green. He's the only one, maybe. Ah, no. Anyway, so. I'm going to talk about the topic is the divisible convex sets. The plan of the talk will be the following. I will uh, first uh, recall the famous and motivating examples, example of divisible convex set. Then I will recall the general definition and uh, important properties. And then I will state our result. Uh, I can state it now, actually. We, we construct new kind of divisible convex sets. And for those who know the words already, we, cons we construct um, uh, non-symmetric, irreducible, non-strictly convex, divisible convex set in every dimension, at least three. I will explain those words. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I will uh, describe our examples, compare them with the previous examples. And uh, if time allows, I will talk uh, about the construction, how we build them. So I start with a hyperbolic surface. Um, which, which comes with the, uh, the hyperbolic structure yields uh, a holonomy a rep representation from the fundamental of group of S into the group of isometries of H2. Which is the universal cover of S. Uh, and we see the group of isometries of H2 we identify it with uh, p s o to one, which we see. Yeah, maybe I'm going to write s s o to one. Maybe it's not exactly true, but almost s o to one, which we see inside s l three r, and we see h two <coughs> as a subset of r p two, as a disk in an affine chart of r p two. So it's also called the Klein model or projective model of uh, the hyperbolic, the Poincaré disk. And uh, so now we are going to deform the representation rho uh, via a technique called uh, bulging, which is a special kind of bending. So deform rho via bulging. So how do we do that? We fix a separating curve, gamma naught, in S. And um, so the idea of bulging, uh, of bending in general, is that the gamma node separates S into two subsurfaces, S1 and S2, on the left and the right. And we are going to uh, deform by not changing the representation on the left and conjugate it on the right using an element that commutes with rho of gamma naught. So for this, we will need a, hy a basic hyperbolic fact, a, a fact from hyperbolic geometry, which says that Rho of gamma naught is uh, diagonalizable, so we can write it uh, as a diagonal matrix in some basis. And now we we choose uh, an element that uh, commute with the rho of gamma naught, a bending, uh, a bulging matrix. We choose the following matrix: uh, B, B, and B to the minus two. And using a so bulging matrix with bulging parameter b, the terms bulging will come will become uh, understandable later on. It's called bending, sometimes, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, bulging is a special kind of bending. Yeah, okay. thanks for the question. You, yeah, you will see why it's why I, I chose to call it bulging. Uh, okay, so let's let's. Uh, Let's uh, let's bulge for this. <laughs> we choose a fundamental uh, gen generators alpha one, alpha two for the beta one, beta two. Uh, as you know, we can write the canonical uh, presentation for pi one of s. So the alpha i's, the beta i's, 
with one relation, the relation that the commutators of the alpha i's be equal to the commutators of the beta i's, which is in fact equal to gamma naught, this commutator. And now we deform, a row, uh, we, produce, we construct a new representation rho b from pi 1 of s uh, to SL3 or uh, by setting uh, new images uh, for the generators. So the alpha i's, we don't change them because they're on the left, and the beta i's, we change them by conjugating them using the Boolean matrix. And uh, yeah, and so uh, one can check that this uh, yields a well-defined morphism because these new G images for the generators they satisfy the, the relations. Well, it's very exercise if you if you never did it. And this is because because uh, MB commutes with rho of gamma naught. Okay, so uh, rho b is a morphism, well-defined morphism. And now, theorem, I think I should attribute it to Choi and Goldman in this particular setting, but there is also a more general result. Choi Goldman. Uh, rho b is uh, uh, faithful, injective, with discrete image. And uh, the way they prove it is by proving something stronger. So there are several ways to prove this, but the way they do it is by proving that rho b of pi 1 of s preserves a properly convex open set of RP2. So uh, uh, by properly convex, I mean convex and bounded in some fine charts. In fact, if B is close enough to 1, then omega is going to be very close to H2, which is a disk. But it's not, uh, it's not going to be an ellipsoid, it's going to be a bit wilder. And so... It's true for every B. Ah, uh, yeah, yes, correct. Not only for uh, B close to 1, that's true. And, um, and uh, on top of that, uh, pi 1 of s acts via rho B. I mean, it's injective, so yeah. Acts on omega properly discontinuously. And co compactly. We say that it divides omega. And omega is called divisible convex set. And uh, yeah, and this is how, afterward, you, you using that, you prove injectivity and discreteness. And in fact, uh, omega is very explicit. So let me try to, to explain what it looks like. As I said, um, it's going to be a deformation of H2. So, uh, we look at all the lifts of gamma naught in H2. So we are in the projective model, geodesics are straight, light, straight lines. And there are infinitely many lifts, of course, everywhere. Uh, so the problem of the projective model is that we see nothing, usually. <laughs> uh, and uh, those lifts, they decompose H2 into infinitely many copies of universal covers of the two subsurfaces S1 and S2. So for example, say here we have one copy of S1 tilde, and then adjacent to it we have lots of copies of S2 tildes. I, all, I, I, I write them uh, the same way, all of them. And then there are infinitely many of them, one here as well. And then adjacent to S2 tilde, there are infinitely many copies of S1 tilde, etc. 
And uh, to, so to construct omega, we are going to deform inductively uh, those, uh, those S1 tildes and those S2 tildes. So I start here, I start with S1 tilde. So on S1 tilde, I have rho here, and here is going to be omega. Here I have rho of pi 1 of S1 that acts. And now I, was, I want something which is preferred by rho b of pi 1 of S1. Rho b of pi 1 of S1 is just rho of pi 1 of S1. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to keep S1 tilde. So it looks something like, uh, maybe I'm, I draw the ball and then I. And then I remove uh, this part. OK. So uh, I'm done with this S1 tilde. And then I deform all the copies of all the S2 tildes adjacent to this S1 tilde. And I want something <coughs> here. I want something which is invariant on the rho b of pi 1 of S2, which is the conjugate by mb of rho of pi 1 of S1, S2, sorry, which preserves S2 tilde. How do I produce something invariant under this? I take mb of S2 tilde. And mb, what does it do? It bulges, uh, it stretches this half. <coughs> like that. And the same thing appears uh, there, uh, except that w so those all the other parts, all the other S2 tilde are stretched as well, but not by mb itself, but I, by a conjugate of mb under, uh, under rho of pi 1 of S1. They look something like that. So like kind of like triangles. They are contained in, if you draw this tangent line here, they are contained uh, in the triangle formed by tangent lines. And, uh, and then you, you iterate. So uh, you deform the S1 tilde adjacent to the S2 tilde as you've already deformed. Th but this time, instead of stretching, you're going to compress using a conjugate of the inverse of mb. And it's kind of believable that when you do that uh, infinitely many times, you will obtain omega, uh, which is uh, convex. And uh, it's going to be invariant by construction. But importantly, it's going to be convex. And uh, yeah, another important thing maybe to notice is that you can also see that you can yeah, convince yourself that it's going to be strictly convex, in fact, in the sense that there is no segment, no non-trivial segment entirely contained in the boundary of omega. And it's going to have C1 boundary, but not C2. Because, for example, here, at this point, we have a change of curvature. Second derivative is discontinuous. And uh, yeah, that's all. This is omega. <coughs> and um, now I'm going to recall the, so this is an example of divisible convex set. Do you have questions? If not, OK, let me recall the general definition of divisible convex set. So uh, properly convex open set. Uh, in general, in RPD, is <coughs> divisible. if there exists a discrete group of order morphisms, so projected transformation that uh, preserve uh, omega, a discrete group, discrete. So because discreteness implies it's going to act automatically properly discontinuously on omega. It's not obvious at first, but it is true. Discrete and which acts co-compactly uh, such that uh, omega over gamma is compact. Ah, that's, that, was, okay, that was a bad idea. Uh, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to use the one on top.
So remember, bulging, very important. We will talk about it again later. So, so I have one question. Yes. So, so the limit set of this new group is this uh, boundary. Is the full boundary? Uh, not in general. Uh, good question. So, good question. Good question. So, uh, oh, sorry. It is true that. So limit set is well defined, but sometimes it's not the full boundary. But uh, if you want, I will come back to it later. Ask, ask me later. Okay. Ask me later. Or uh, at the end of the talk, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good question. So we have, ah, uh, no. We have seen uh, one example, which is H2, is a divisible complex set, and in fact, all HN are divisible as well. Mm. This is due to, to Ziegel, I guess. The, the fact that there exist uh, uniform lattices in, in PSO N1. And, and we've seen another kind of uh, divisible convex set here that looks uh, uh, not, yeah, not like an ellipsoid. Uh, and it was strictly convex. C1 boundary. And in fact, the, uh, the bulging technique, which I just erased, uh, works in every dimension. You just need to start with a hyper closed hyperbolic manifold, which contains a uh, hypersurface, totally just the closed hypersurface inside, and then you can do the same. This is due to um, Johnson and, Mi and Milson, uh, this technique, and Benoit proved, okay, maybe I can write Johnson, Milson. And then Benoit proved uh, that, uh, that uh, it was a strictly convex C1 boundary. So the main difference, maybe, between those two examples is that this one is much more symmetric <coughs> in the sense that the group of automorphism is much bigger. It acts transitively. The action is transitive on omega. And it's... Uh, Um, a semi-simple algebraic subgroup uh, of uh, SLD plus sonar. Whereas on the other case, it's not transitive at all because the group is discrete. And it acts properly discontinuously on omega. And it's also Zariski dense. We talked about it. It's kind of the contrary of being some simple, you could say. <laughs> uh, there exist other kind of, ah, so for this reason, this is called symmetric. And this is called non-symmetric. And uh, there exist other examples of symmetric divisible complex sets. Uh, they are interesting, but I don't have time to talk much about them. So I'm going to be very quick. You can find uh, projective models of other kind of symmetric spaces than, than H2, HN, sorry. For example, not, not every symmetric spaces, but some of them, for example, SLNR over S1. And the important thing is that uh, there is an explicit list of all the symmetric divisible complex sets. We, we know them. Then there is yet uh, another kind to produce div examples of divisible complex sets which is that uh, given two divisible convex sets, one in P or D1 plus one, say a point, a point is a divisible convex set, and omega two in P or D2 plus one, another uh, divisible convex set, you can put them inside uh, the same project, a bigger projective space, D1 plus D2 plus two, and this one as well. And then you can take the convex full and you obtain omega convex full of omega 1 and omega 2. And it is also divisible if omega 1 and omega 2 were divisible. And uh, it's not so hard to, to see that. <coughs> if you have gamma 1 dividing omega 1 and gamma 2 dividing omega 2, then you can divide gamma using 
uh, omega using gamma 1 to act co-compactly here, times gamma 2 to act co-compactly independently there, and then you also need a z-factor to act co-compactly on the height sort of in between them. So here gamma 1 is going to be trivial in the, if omega 1 is... A, is a and not, so this is a cone, for example, here a disk and a point. You can also produce a, a triangle, convex rule of three points, using this. So this is called reducible. And we are going to focus on irreducible divisible convex set. So uh, after if Benoit, this was known, and then if Benoit proved those examples were strictly convex, and uh, he, he wondered, ah, do there exist non-strictly convex examples? A priori, right now, it's not, from what I've said, it's not completely clear why this dichotomy between strictly convex and non-strictly convex is interesting. I will try to explain later, in a minute. But, so he asked this question, and he answered it. So there also exist non-strictly convex examples. And then he proved also that automatically the boundary cannot be C1. And uh, so, Yves Benoit. But they are all in dimension, all his examples. He constructed them using the Coxter groups and work of Winberg. And they have dimension 3, 4, 5, 6, but no more. And, uh, and after that, uh, other people uh, constructed other kinds of uh, nice, ex interesting examples of non-strictly <coughs> convex divisible convex sets. But all of them always had uh, dimension at most 6. And so our contribution with Gabriele was to show that uh, so there exist non-symmetric, irreducible, non-strictly convex, a divisible convex set uh, in every dimension at least three. So uh, we know, it's, it, it was known before that they do not exist in dimension two. This is due to Winberg, uh, no, uh, Benzekri, sorry. Okay, so this is, uh, this is our result. Uh, do you have questions apart from the limit sets? <laughs> no, actually I can answer. In this case, the limit set is the full boundary, but not in this case. In this, in this is sort of those, those three, we will see they are rank one, and then those two are higher rank. Yeah, so thank you for the question. But it's not, uh, here it's not so hard to show it. So it has dimension one. Hausdorff dimension. Yeah. Ah, no, 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 the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set is the, it's not only, I mean, it's the dimension of omega minus one. Um, it's not, s here it's not so hard to show the limit set is the whole boundary, but here it's not, uh, it's not as easy. Yeah, you need uh, several work, work of uh, Zimmer and, and me. But it's not the today's talk. Okay, uh, so if there is no question, uh, I'm going to talk about, ah yeah, this di dichotomy between strictly convex and non-strictly convex. And maybe I can come back to... Is this your theorem? Yes, yes, with Gabriele. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but now it's, well, it's too... <laughs> so, I'm not, sure I can, I'm not even sure I can retrieve the other one. Uh, okay, so dichotomy, strictly convex, non strictly convex. Why is it interesting? So one way to, to see this dichotomy is to talk about dynamics. And uh, roughly, uh, here on the strictly convex case, we have happening uniform hyperblicity.
Whereas here it's not uniformly hyperbolic, but ah, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, omega. I assume it's uh, non-symmetric and irreducible for the rest of the talk. So only the two, the two cases on the right. Okay, so strictly convex, uniform hyperbolicity. Not strictly convex, not uniform hyperbolic, but we still have some hyperbolicity, sort of a partial hyperbolicity, where I don't give a precise meaning to to partial here. So I need to, to do a small parenthesis before I, I go more into detail. I want to talk about an important tool in the study of divisible convex sets, which is the Hilbert metric. So parenthesis. Um, the Hilbert metric. So whenever you have a properly convex open set, there is a metric defined by Hilbert. When you take two points x and y, uh, I'm going to define this, this distance. You draw the projective line through them. You look at the intersection with the boundary. And then you define Hilbert's distance. d omega between x and y is one half the logarithm of the cross ratio of the four point a x y b. In other words, a minus y, the distance between a and y, we fix some, some Euclidean norm on the affine charts, and then afterward it doesn't depend on this Euclidean norm. And this distance, so um, it's gamma invariant. Uh, if omega is, is uh, an ellipsoid, then you retrieve the hyperbolic space. This, this is why there is an, a one half in front. And also another important property is that the projective segments between x and y is a geodesic. Uh, this allows to define, in particular, a geodesic flow, Hilbert geodesic flow, whose dynamics uh, is uh, important in the study of divisible convex set. So whenever you have a vector v, phi t of v, so phi t is geodesic flow, phi t of v is the vector tangent to the same projective line at distance t. t is equal to the distance between x and y. OK, uh, so important uh, tool. And end of the parenthesis now. I go back to the di dichotomy. And I'm going to talk about first the strictly convex case, omega strictly convex. So in this setting, uh, why do we have uniform, a uniform uh, hyperbolicity? For example, I'm going to throw certain words that maybe you, you don't know, but afterward, I'm not going to define those words, but afterward, I'm going to give a more elementary uh, property hyperbolic of hyperbolicity. So the geodesic flow is Anosov. This is due to, to Benoit. Every time I, I forget to write a name, it's probably Benoit. <laughs> <laughs> Except the theorem there. <laughs> uh, Anosov. Also, the group gamma is, so this you know, <laughs> uh, gamma hyperbolic. I mean, everybody knows now. Uh, gamma acts on the boundary of omega with the uniform convergence actions. We talked about it, in, I mean, Tengren talked about it. And uh, the boundary of omega is the boundary of the group. These are all the typical examples of uh, hyperbolicity, hyperbolic behavior. And now, uh, an easier one, sort of. You have, so we have omega, we have the quotient, omega over gamma. Pick a closed geodesic here on the right, C, and uh, take a lift, C tilde. So let's take it oriented. Take a lift, C tilde. On C tilde, there is an element of the group, gamma, which acts by translation, going this direction, by translation on the, the projective interval. And it fixes the two endpoints, gamma plus and gamma minus. And the hyperbolic property is that we have north-south dynamic. 
in the sense that gamma n x converge to gamma plus for every forward orbit converge to gamma plus uh, ex except the, the orbit of gamma minus. Oh, sorry, so x is say for example in the boundary of omega. And uh, this is actually, the, this is a consequence of strict convexity. It's not so hard to prove. Maybe I can try to give a very short proof. Okay, let's give a proof. Um, just to, yeah, to, to understand a bit what's going on. So imagine this is not the case for contradiction. Imagine you have some subsequence, you have your x here, and you have a subsequence, gamma nk, x, that converge toward y, which is different from gamma plus. Uh, okay, we want to have a con contradiction. Pick a point, pick two points, p on this uh, segment between gamma minus gamma plus and q here. P and q are going to be inside omega because gamma minus, because omega is so strictly convex, and more precisely because omega is strictly convex at gamma minus. It's really, uh, yeah, at gamma minus. P and Q are inside omega, so you can compute their Hilbert distance. And now let's look at their image under gamma and k. So gamma and k P converge to gamma plus, because we act by translation. And gamma and k uh, Q, we don't know exactly where it goes, but at least we know it's somewhere on this, uh, this geodetic. Gamma and k Q. And now let's look at the distance between gamma nk p and gamma nk q. So because the Hilbert distance is invariant under, uh, under gamma, uh, it, is, uh, it is the same as the dis distance between p and q. It doesn't change. <coughs> but you can see here that because omega is strictly convex at gamma plus this time, the distance here between gamma and kp and, and this point is going to zero, this distance, the, I mean the Euclidean distance. And now if you look at the definition of here, uh, the, I mean, uh, yeah, one of the two denominators goes to zero and this forces this distance to go to infinity. Which is absurd because this is equal to distance between p and q. Voilà. Uh, so in fact, we didn't really use the fact that omega was strictly convex. We only used that it was strictly convex here and there at two points, where I didn't define what it means to be strictly convex at a point. But OK, this is all I wanted to say about strictly convex case. You need hyperbolic behavior. And now let's talk about the, do you have questions? Let's talk about the non-strictly convex case. <coughs> so omega, in this case, the flow, this is, uh, yeah, everything where, yeah. This is due to Yves-Benoit, the flow is not Anosov. And uh, the group is not Kromov hyperbolic. And the action is not a convergence action. Uh, but, so not uniform hyperbolicity, but Zimmer, uh, Zimmer and the Zimmer, which is here somewhere, prove that at least uh, we have partial hyperbolicity in the sense that there exists a closed geodesic along which phi t has hyperbolic behavior. In other words, we have this, this, uh, this north-south dynamic. And gamma is not hyperbolic, but um, Mithul Islam proved that at least it's asylindrically hyperbolic. I'm not going to define. It's a, a weakening of hyperbolicity. So we have this, at least. And in fact, it turns out in all the example all known example, including our example with Gabriele, we have much, we know much more than just that. 
this is what I want to say now. So omega not strictly convex. And so we also, when omega has dimension 3, in general, outside of the known examples, we have much more information. This is due to Yves Benoit. We know the following. So omega is dimension 3. Uh, the reason it's not strictly convex is because it contains properly embedded triangles. Like that. Uh, properly embedded triangle. Uh, it means the interior of T is in the interior of omega and the boundary of T is in the boundary of omega. And because of that, we have the edges in the boundary, so the omega is not strictly convex. In fact, we have one properly embedded triangles, and we also have infinitely many of them, because um, uh, because they, they, they are, you can you also have the translate under the group gamma. Um, but uh, you have all the gamma orbits of this triangle. But in fact, it turns out you only have finitely many or gamma orbit of properly embedded tri uh, triangles, so in particular countably many triangles. So we, we, we understand well those pets. Also, they satisfy nice, they are kind of well separated when you have a sequence of triangles, uh, inject injective sequence of, of uh, pets. It has to degenerate in the boundary. We also know they are disjoint. We know lots uh, of things about them. And, uh, uh, sorry, higher. And also, they capture the non-strict convexity of omega in the sense that omega is strictly convex. The boundary of omega is strictly convex outside and C1, outside the pets. Uh, so this is, oh, yeah. Omega is sort of hyperbolic outside the pets. And uh, what else do we know? We know the stabilizer of the pets. Uh, it's a Z2. And hence, in the boundary, the quotient, omega over gamma, the triangle projects to a sort of totally geodesic tori, subtori, projectively fat subtori t over its stabilizer over z2. Can't be a bit bigger than z2. It's, you know, you know, I'm cheating a little bit, but it roughly it's z2 up to finite index. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's say if gamma is torsion free. And uh, one last thing, gamma is relatively hyperbolic with respect to the stabilizer of the pets. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, I'm not going to define relatively hyperbolicity, sorry. Maybe w a more elementary property, which is similar to the one before. If you pick a closed geodesic, which is not C, which is not contained in a flat, then it lifts uh, to uh, a, a projective interval whose endpoints are strictly convex, and hence, you have C tilde on which acts gamma, and hence gamma is going to have a north-south dynamic for exactly the same argument as before. But if you take, so this is hyperbolicity, hyperbolic behavior. However, if you take a closed geodesic <coughs> C1 inside the flat, then you're going to lift C1 tilde to closed geodesic in, in T, and it doesn't have the north-south dynamic. It has something a little bit weaker. Every orbit under under gamma one, uh, it doesn't. It, it accumulates on the boundary of the triangle, um, but it could accumulate on different points, not necessarily on this point. Yeah. Um, so and then, uh, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, ah, yeah. So this is the what happens in dimension three. Um, this is, was proved by ben Benoit. 
and it happens that in all known examples we have it's a very similar picture. Uh, so what does it look like? For example, let's look at uh, the known examples, the example known before our work with Gabriele. So Benoit's example, I forgot to say, uh, yeah, I mean, I said it a bit, but I didn't say the word, the, the, the names. That was work of uh, yeah, Ludovic Marquis, Balas Dadigerli, Choi Li Marquis, um, Li Marquis Riolo. Lots of people constructed interesting uh, digital complex sets. And all these examples, they look like the following. They, the same picture, except that instead of properly embedded triangles, we have properly embedded simplices in general. So, uh, known examples. Old, old, I'm going to say old, yeah. Old known example. So instead of triangles, we have properly embedded simplices. Actually, it's better to talk about maximal properly embedded simplices. So for example, we can have a properly embedded tetahedron in dimension four. So it's hard to make a picture. You have to, because we're, yeah, it's in dimension four, but some, something like that. And uh, the rest is still true. We have finitely many gamma orbits of such maximal PES, uh, properly embedded simplices. They are well separated, disjoint boundary. Uh, omega is strictly convex outside of those yeah, so PES. Now, uh, the stabilizer, we know the stabilizer of the PES, so it's not Z2, but it's the Z to the dimension of the PES. And gamma is relatively hyperbolic with respect to the stabilizer. Um, I should have written it. And uh, that's all. Yeah. So this is all known examples. And now, our example with Gabriele, they uh, look similar too. So Um, except that instead of properly embedded simplices, we have, can you guess? <laughs> yes, exactly, thank you. So it was in the title, there was a hint. Wait, the whole time. <laughs> 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 thank you for enthusiasm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the cones I drew at the beginning, so I said we won't talk about reducible divisible convex set, but in fact, they show up naturally. They showed up in, with triangles, simplices, and cones. But apart from that, uh, it's the same picture, so cones. Uh, strictly convex, uh, <coughs> finitely many orbits, uh, well separated, uh, strictly convex outside of uh, NC1 outside of the uh, proper embedded cones. Now there is a little difference here. The stabilizers, they are not abelian anymore. So I said there was the, the, the gamma that divides the point here, which is trivial, so we can forget about it. And then there is the gamma that divides this. So it's the pi one, the, f the fundamental group of a hyperbolic manifold of dimension. So omega is of dimension d, and this is going to be dimension d minus two. And then there is the z factor. Yeah, this is a stabilizer. And uh, it acts co-compactly on, as before, I didn't say it actually, forgot. It acts co-compactly on T. And uh, downstairs, T is T mod the stabilizer is going to be uh, something like uh, uh, the manifold, the hyperbolic manifold, times S1. Um, yeah, so something, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and we have also relative hyperbolicity. Yeah, and I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, do you have questions?
Uh, uh, no, 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 sorry, uh, sorry. I mean, that's what I know, sorry. Uh, okay. No, no, that's not what I wanted to say. <laughs> sorry. You have to finish that up with the video. Okay, so. Uh, if there is no question, let me talk a little bit. I still have 15 minutes, right? 14 minutes. You confuse me. <laughs> I don't, I uh, so let's talk a little bit about the construction. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because this is one section of the talk. You, know, you there was the motivating example, then the definition, I just want to make sure you get your <laughs> and then there is the strictly convex, not strictly convex, and the description, and now the construction. So um, I'm going to describe the construction uh, in dimension two. So here in the theorem, it's dimension at least three. But it turns out, this was, uh, Gabriele actually noticed that, very nice observation, the construction still work in dimension two. Uh, the result is completely uh, uninteresting. But uh, something very nice is, is, is that it's much easier to explain the construction and you can make drawings. Okay, maybe I can do it, uh, I can start here. Didn't you say in dimension two something doesn't exist? Uh, sorry? Didn't you say in dimension two doesn't exist or something? Yeah, so uh, our construction makes sense, and but it yields uh, non-symmetric, irreducible, strictly convex, divisible convex set. So the hyperbolic manifold will be a point? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> yeah, the flats are going to be uh, geodesics, I, I guess. I don't know. So construction in dimension two. Uh, so we start in H2 with a quadrilateral, a regular quadrilateral, like that. So all the angles are the same or strictly less than pi over 2, not strictly, and this is important. And then we take two copies of this quadrilateral and we glue them together to obtain a, a sort of hyperbolic pillow. We glue them on, on the edges. And uh, so a hyperbolic pillow, it's a sphere endowed with a hyperbolic structure with four uh, cone singularities of angle, uh, the double of this angle. Uh, if we remove the four singularities, we obtain uh, um, a surface with a hyperbolic structure, which is not complete. So in particular, uh, the developing map is a mess. It's not injective at all. Um, we, but we still kind of understand what it looks like, this, this uh, developing map. How do we construct it? You start with the quadrilateral here and you reflect it along the side. And then you keep reflecting. So you obtain four nook quadrilateral, each one of them with three free sides, and you reflect them along this side. Yeah, yeah, and you keep going, and you obtain sort of tiling, except that it's not a tiling because the, the quadrilateral are going to overlap at some, for example, around this point, it's going to rotate, and it's going to say if the angle was not commensurable to pi, uh, yeah. And also, I would, yeah, in, maybe in some cases the developing map is not surjective either. Well, the important thing is not injective, and now what we do is that we bulge this hyperbolic structure uh, into a projective structure using uh, the same bulging technique I talked I told, uh, at the beginning. So, uh, look, different color. So we don't touch this quadrilateral and we, we, ah yeah, we bulge along the edges. Um, along the bot top and bottom edges, we bulge. So these two quadrilateral are going to be stretched. <coughs> ah, bad pictures. Okay, sorry. We are in projective space. So everything is like that. 
everything is straight. And we bulge top and bottom, we stretch them like that. Using the same bulging parameter, say. Whereas on the right and the left, we compress instead. And we keep doing that uh, iteratively. So for example, this one here, uh, it was bulged with, with this one. And then it is, uh, I think, bulged again compared to this one. I mean, yeah, you have to think a little bit, but it's either bulged or stretched, uh, sorry, bulged or compressed, contracted. Anyway, you keep doing that and you obtain a, a projective structure this time on the, this, uh, this uh, sphere with uh, four punctures. Uh, and at first, when you bulge a little bit, the, the structure is, is going to be a mess, to stay, stay being a mess, because the developing mic is still going to be non-injective, of course, because you, you only uh, deform a little bit the quadrilaterals. But what we show is that if you bulge enough, at some point, uh, the developing map is going to become injective, and even better, uh, injective with convex image. In fact, it comes together. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe I can show a picture about this. So I'm going to. Picture made with the help of, with the almost made by Teddy, the Theodore Weissman. So we used a, uh, a tool he developed, a program. I could, say, I guess, I can say. Uh, you can find on his website to make drawings. It's very nice. It's called Geometry <coughs> Geometry Tools. Teddy is uh, somewhere. Ah, here. If you are, if you need to make, a, yeah, you can go to his website. There is an explanation on how to use it. Sometimes it bugs, it doesn't work, and then you send, <laughs> and then you send him an email. <laughs> but you'll see, it's super nice. Uh, did it work? You still no. So ah, I forgot. Ah, yeah, this one. Okay. Okay, you're seeing the end. Ah, no, you're seeing nothing. Ah, yeah, you start with the, the hyperbolic structure and then you deform. At first, it's still a mess, and then slowly, slowly, it sort of unfolds. And if you wait long enough, it becomes a so here there is only finitely many tiles, and but all of the tiles are convex, not only this finitely many. I, of course, I couldn't draw. I tried with more tiles, but it was with yeah, we don't see anything. Uh, okay, so what we obtain actually is not the divisible convex set itself. What you see, um, of course, you don't obtain the divisible convex set because. Uh, so what is this? This is a universal cover of, where was it? Uh, ah, good. This is, a, I'm going to put back the, the lights. So what we see is the universal cover of the four printer sphere, which is not a closed manifold. So it doesn't divide the, divide the, the, the omega, but it turns out you can so, so we show that uh, this four pointer sphere, which I can draw this way, is the interior of a compact uh, com uh, convex projective manifold with boundary, where the boundary are totally geodesic. They are contained in hyperplanes and uh, which lifts to faces, facets, maybe, uh, in, the, in the convex set. So, and uh, what we do then, so we have now boundaries, totally just boundary. And now we can double. Uh, 
and we obtain a closed manifold, right? I, I don't know what the genus is here. A closed manifold. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and we can show it's not it's not clear a priori that when you double a convex Prochi manifold that the result in manifold is also convex. It's not always the case, but here we we can prove it is the case. Um, and uh, so actually, it's funny because when you bulge, it's, there is a, a, a critical parameter where it becomes convex. And for this critical parameter, when you double, you don't obtain something convex. You need to go just a little bit further. And then you can double, close manifold, and this is a divisible convex set. And uh, OK, so this was the dimension two picture. Now maybe I can say a, a quick word about dimension, uh, high, higher dimension. Uh, do you have questions? So in higher dimensions. So here we started with the quadrilateral. Um, in higher dimension, instead, we are going to start with, so this is um, uh, a compact hyperbolic manifold. Uh, with boundary. And the boundary, there are several kinds of points in the boundary. There, there is the totally geodesic pieces, the edges of the quadrilateral, and there are the corners, which are co-dimension two. So co-dimension two corner. And then this we call co-dimension one walls. And uh, so in, in general, we, we, we pick a compact hyperbolic manifold with wall corners and walls. So with boundary, a convex, by the way, with boundary, where the boundary has corners, co-dimension two, and walls co-dimension one, which, and both of them are totally geodesic. But there is no, we don't take the cube, oops, co-dimension one. We don't take the cube, for example, because the cube has singularities of co-dimension uh, three. So uh, the fact that there exists such a manifold is not actually not uh, so obvious. You need uh, arithmetic uh, techniques to build them. And in fact, uh, we need something a little bit more than just that. We need to know something about the combinatorial. So, ah, yeah, we need the angles of the corners first to be less than pi over two. So this adds a little bit more compl complexity. And then we need to know something about the combinatorics of the walls because we need to know which wall we bulge and which wall we contract. So we need to be able to color the walls into uh, black and white such that the two walls that meet at the corner have different colors, like, uh, like on this one. And then uh, the white one, we are going to bulge them, and the black one, we are going to contract them. So uh, yeah, to, uh, yeah so to, to build this is not really not, uh, not easy. But uh, there are uh, famous techniques to do that, uh, in particular using arithmetic lattices, using separating properties, uh, etc. And then once we have that, we do exactly the, uh, the same thing as before, and, and it works uh, exactly the same thing, in the same way, in fact, it's as in the dimension two cases. And, uh, ah yeah, sorry, maybe one last word. So now the corners are closed hyperbolic manifolds of dimension d minus two. And, uh, and this is where the cone comes from. The, we, have, we have this, uh, I maybe I can do a picture. So the, the manifold looks like that. We have uh, 
and uh, we double it as before. We remove the singularity, the corner. We bulge. We obtain a manifold. Uh, we, we obtain a convex projective structure on the manifold. And the manifold, once we add a boundary, the boundary we add is the corner times a circle because it's the complement, the boundary of the tubular neighborhood of the corner. This is how the cones come in and, and make everything non stylic convex. And uh, that's all. Thanks for listening. So I'm, I'm still a little confused about the picture. So when you say you bulge, right, you need to have, you need to tell me three, the three, I mean, what's the base? If you want to write the bulge at this diagonal, the trick you choose the basis. What are the three bases? What are the three points here that you use? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, good question. So before, maybe I can redo the picture, the previous picture, the, the first bulging. We had something like that. We had the lifts, you remember? And bulging here, I said, was like doing something like that, stretching. And fine, he's stretching sort of within the, the domain bounded by the two tangent lines here. And here, the picture would be like that. You, you look at this, the two intersection points, look at the two tangent lines, you look where they intersect, you obtain a triangle, and bulging looks like that. Right? And the more you bulge, the closer to a triangle. And here, it's exactly the same thing. Everything is attracted toward this point, which was the, the intersection of the tangent lines at these two points of the hyperbolic space. So it's a hyperbolic bulging. I mean, yeah, we, um, yeah, the, 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 does it answer the question? I, I forgot. Okay. Ah, it was uh, thing. But, but as you bulge the sub, I mean. Yeah, so it doesn't look like that, maybe. I can make a more accurate picture. Thank you. So to make a more accurate picture, maybe I draw this. So this point, for example, is attracted toward this and it stay on this line. Because the bulging matrix, it fixes every point here. So it fixes this one, it fixes this one. And then it acts this by sending it, for example, here. And then you have this one. So this one is attracted here. And then, uh, is it better? So at the end, it looks uh, a bit. Uh, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> Is it better? Um, and the contracting, you can draw the contracting part? Ah, uh, yes. I'm going to draw it here as well. <laughs> if you contract instead, so this point is going to be sent here, this one here. It's going to look like that. But, but you say you do this for every quadrilateral? Yeah. Uh, afterward, it's hard to make a picture. I mean, there is this. <laughs> you, have <two> <laughs> you have two parameters. You have one for the bulging and one for the contracting? Uh, yes. Uh, but we take, uh, in practice, we just take the opposite. Uh, yeah. But you, you, don't, you could take, actually, you, yeah, you don't need to take the inverse. You just need to take a big one here, a big one here. I think they could be in, 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 in different, a priori. A small one, a small one, and you're good. And uh, so, uh, I, if you want, I can try. Yeah, I can try to explain a little bit wh where this convexity comes from. It's not so, so, so complicated actually. I forgot. But uh, ah. since the next talk is ah, in yeah. ten minutes, so we wrap here, and then if you have more questions, so then uh, you can talk to him during the cocktail party, right? Yes. Okay. So let's thank <laughs> you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.